M S W Media. Thanks to Thrive Cosmetics for supporting the Daily Beans. Get luxury, high-performance cosmetics that highlight your best features. For every purchase, Thrive Cosmetics donates to help a woman thrive. Go to thrivecosmetics.com slash dailybeans for 15% off your first order. Today's episode is dedicated to Bill Russell and Nichelle Nichols. Beans, Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Monday, August 1st, 2022. Today, the missing text message scandal has now reached Chad Wolf and Ken Cuccinelli. A hot mic captures Matt Gates discussing pardons and Mueller redactions with Roger Stone. An RNC election integrity official is named in a Department of Justice grand jury subpoena. And the sentencing hearing for Guy Reffitt, in which the Department of Justice is seeking the longest sentence to date, takes place today. I'm your host, Allison Gill. Ah, hi, everyone. Welcome to the week. Welcome to August. It's August already. My goodness. I'm going to be joined later in the show by the director of digital storytelling at Define American. Her name is Shauna Sigelko. And the sentencing of Guy Reffitt is happening today. This is the person that the Department of Justice added a domestic terrorism consideration to making their recommendation of 15 years the longest sentence in their investigation so far. Back in March, a jury found him guilty on all counts, including transporting a firearm in furtherance of civil disorder, for those who say the insurrection wasn't armed, obstruction of an official proceeding, entering or remaining in a restricted area on grounds with a firearm, obstructing officers during a civil disorder, and obstruction of justice, hindering communication through force or threat of physical force. The judge in the case is Dabney Friedrich, a Trump appointee, and we will see what happens in that case. All right, we actually have a ton of news to get to from the weekend, so let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right, text messages for President Donald Trump's acting Homeland Security Secretary Chad Wolf, dong dong, and acting Deputy Secretary Ken Cuccinelli are missing for a key period leading up to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. That's according to four people briefed on the matter and internal emails. The discovery of the missing records for the senior most Homeland Security officials, which has not been previously reported, increases the volume of potential evidence that has vanished regarding the time around the Capitol attack. It comes as both congressional and criminal investigators at the Justice Department seek to piece together the effort by Trump and his allies to overturn the results of the election and lawfully block the peaceful transfer of power. The Department of Homeland Security notified the agency's inspector general in late February that Wolf's and Cuccinelli's texts were lost in a reset of their government phones when they left their jobs in January. In preparation for the new Biden administration is is what they're saying. Well, he was coming in. We're just getting rid of our old phones. That's according to internal records obtained by the Project on Government Oversight and shared with The Washington Post. The office of the department's undersecretary of management also told the government watchdog that the text messages for its boss, Undersecretary Randolph Tex Alice, the former Secretary of Service Director, were also no longer available due to a previously planned (laughs) obstruction of justice. I mean, phone reset. The Office of Inspector General Joseph V. Kufari did not press the department leadership at the time to explain why they didn't preserve these records, nor did he seek ways to recover the lost data. That's according to four people briefed on the watchdog's actions. Kufari also failed to alert Congress to the potential destruction of government records. Hmm. The revelation comes on the heels of the discovery that text messages of the Secret Service agents, critical firsthand witnesses to the events, were deleted more than a year ago and may never be recovered. The news of their missing records set off a firestorm because the text could have corroborated the account of a former White House aide describing the president's state of mind on January 6th. And in one case, the aide, this Cassidy Hutchinson, of course, said a top official told her that Trump had tried to attack the senior Secret Service agent who refused to take the president to the Capitol with his supporters marching there. In a nearly identical scenario to that of the DHS leader's texts, the Secret Service alerted Kufari's office seven months ago, in December of 2021, that the agency had deleted thousands of agents and employees' text messages in an agency-wide reset of government phones. 
They brought in the first guy, transferred his phone. Everything was lost. Oh, let's just keep going. Let's just keep going until everybody's shit is deleted. Kufari's office did not notify Congress until mid-July, 18 months and two weeks after January 6th, despite multiple congressional committees pending requests for these records, including before they even started the migration. The telephone and text communications of Wolf and Cuccinelli in the days leading up to January 6th could have shed considerable light on Trump's actions and plans. Remember how I keep saying what was the plan once he got to the Capitol? It was probably in there. In the weeks before the attack on the Capitol, Trump had been pressuring both men to help him claim the 2020 election results were rigged and to seize voting machines in key swing states to try to rerun the election. On Twitter, Chad Wolf wrote, I complied with all data retention laws <coughs> and returned all my equipment fully loaded to the department. Full stop. DHS has all my text, emails, and phone logs and schedules, etc. Any issues with missing data needs to be addressed by the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah, he complied with all data retention laws. But did he know that his phone was going to be wiped? That's his cover. The discovery of missing records for top officials running the DHS during the final days of the administration raises new questions about what could have been learned and about what other text messages and evidence the department and other agencies might have erased. That's an apparent violation of the Federal Records Act, by the way. And that's other agencies. That's what I want to know. Especially where inspectors general were installed by Trump. Department of Transportation, Department of Defense. Ellis over at the NSA as general counsel. The intelligence community as a whole. So... Starting in late December, numerous DHS intelligence units across the country were warning of extremely worrisome chatter in white nationalist and pro-Trump social media platforms that were promoting coming armed to the January 6th rally. That would be in there. In late December, Trump railed in a cabinet meeting that his secretaries were failing to properly help him investigate fraud that had corruptly given the election to Biden, but cited, of course, unsubstantiated claims. Trump fired Christopher Krebs as director of cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency in a tweet after Krebs countered Trump's claims of fraud and complained that Wolf should have moved faster to force Krebs out. So that firing information is probably in there. On New Year's Eve of 2020, Trump called Cuccinelli to pressure him to seize voting machines in swing states to help him block the peaceful transfer of power. Trump falsely told him that the acting attorney general had just said that it was Cuccinelli's job to seize voting machines and, quote, you're not doing your job. Cuccinelli was in Washington on the day of the attack and toured the Capitol that night to survey the damage. Wolf was on an official trip to the Middle East. After the Capitol attack, several lawmakers called for hearings into why DHS had failed to anticipate the threat. And, um, you know, that this threat put the vice president's life in jeopardy and all of the police officers that were there were sitting ducks. Wolf resigned five days later after the attack, citing recent events, as well as legal rulings questioning his legitimacy to continue leading the department as an acting secretary for 14 months. Remember Trump? I like acting. Acting is my favorite. Acting secretaries are my favorite. That's the way Putin runs his government. Government Accountability Office, GAO, filed a report in 2020 found that Wolf and Cuccinelli were ineligible to serve. Remember? So if I were you, I'd look for more stories about people who may have communicated with Donald losing their data. I've said from the beginning that the DHS OIG is complicit in this. And as my goddaughter would say, people need to start listening to Tanta Alley. That's me. I'm Tanta Alley. Also from Betsy Woodruff Swan, in addition to a group of former President Trump's top lawyers, the Justice Department's January 6th probe is also seeking communications to and from a Republican National Committee staffer. At least three witnesses in the DOJ's investigation of so-called alternate electors, fraudulent electors, two in Arizona and one in Georgia, have received subpoenas demanding communications to and from a guy named Josh Findlay, who is now the RNC's national director for election integrity. Politico reviewed the subpoena sent to the Georgia witness after The Washington Post published it, published two of the Arizona copies, the Arizona subpoenas. Findlay's appearance in the documents means the Justice Department has taken an interest in his communications as part of its probe related to pro-Trump GOP officials and activists who presented themselves as legit electors from states that Biden won. Findlay worked for Trump's 2020 campaign in multiple capacities, 
In January 2019, the campaign announced he was joining the team that would handle the 2020 RNC, the Republican National Convention. After the convention, he worked as an attorney on Trump's campaign's legal team. The three subpoenas ordered the witnesses to share all documents and communications from October 2020 on to, from, with, or including a list of people that included Findlay. While Findlay is not a central figure in the January 6th Select Committee's investigation, the head of the Trump's campaign legal team, Matt Morgan, mentioned him in testimony on the panel. If you remember that, at the hearing on June 21st, the panel played a video clip where one of its investigators, Casey Lucier, said some Trump campaign lawyers, quote, became convinced that convening electors in states that Trump lost was no longer appropriate. On November 18th, 2020, Lucier noted Trump allied lawyer Kenneth Cheesebro had written a memo calling for that strategy, which generated pushback. Quote, at that point, I had Josh Findlay email Cheesebro politely to say, this is your task. That's what Morgan told the select committee in testimony. You are responsible for the electoral college issues moving forward. And this was my way of taking that responsibility to zero. Findlay's visibility into plans regarding alternate electors didn't end on Election Day. Politico reviewed an email sent to him on December 12th, two days before, you know, December 14th date, showing David Schaefer, head of the Georgia Republican Party, and and himself as an alternate elector, directing one of his subordinates to contact Finlay about the alternate elector plans. So he was a go-between. A lawyer for Schaefer declined to comment on the email. So Findlay started his job at RNC after Biden's inauguration. And as its chair, Ronna McDaniel announced a new committee on election integrity with the stated purpose of ensuring voters have confidence in future election processes. Former Attorney General Bill Barr has said the FBI found no evidence of voter fraud. And we know that. And he also said Trump's claims of voter fraud were nonsense and bullshit. Nonetheless, Trump has continued to stoke baseless arguments that his loss to Biden was illegitimate. And Republican voters have moved to elevate champions of those allegations, including Pennsylvania Republican gubernatorial nominee Doug Mastriano. In his role at the RNC, Findlay had discussed the party's work scrutinizing an election administration. In a video call hosted by Texas RNC committee woman Tony Ann Dashiel and posted on YouTube on July 26th of last year, Findlay said the party was gearing up to train and build the largest, most well-prepared election integrity organization in the history of the Republican Party. He also described, quote, the first ever Republican Party National Election Integrity College, which included 20 candidates and was held in Washington, D.C. the week before the call. Quote, we need to put eyes on every part of this election process. He continued, we're going to have thousands and thousands of volunteers out there. So a big part of the curriculum at this college was recruiting and training and placing volunteers. It's frightening. And as Roger Stone prepared to stand trial in 2019, complaining he was under pressure from federal prosecutors to incriminate Trump, a close ally of the president repeatedly assured Stone that the boss would likely grant him clemency if he were convicted. That's according to New Audio. At an event at a Trump property that October, Matt Gates predicted Stone would be found guilty at his trial in Washington the following month, but he wouldn't do a day in prison. Gates was apparently unaware they were being recorded by a documentary filmmaker following Stone, whom special counsel Robert Mueller III had charged with obstruction of a congressional investigation. And, uh, of course, Roger Stone is like, Matt Gates thinks he was recorded illegally, but that's not the case. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Quote, the boss still has a very favorable view of you, said Gates to Stone, saying the president has said it directly. He also said, I don't think a big guy can let you go down for this. Gates at one point told Stone he was working on getting him a pardon but was hesitant to say more backstage at the event in which speakers were being filmed for online broadcast. He said, since there are many, many recording devices around right now, I don't feel like I'm in a position to speak freely about the work I've already done on that subject. So he knew there were recording devices around. So the recording is not illegal. Also, that's corrupt intent. Knowing that there are recording devices around and not being able to talk about your crimes very often and much and loudly. Why? Why do you want to keep him quiet? That's intent. The lawmaker also told Stone during their conversation that Stone was mentioned a lot in redacted portions of the Mueller report, appearing to refer to portions the Justice Department had shown to select members of Congress confidentially in a skiff. Quote, they're going to do you because you're not going to have a defense. That's what Gates told Stone. 
Gates is a member of the House Judiciary Committee. At the time of the conversation, the committee was investigating whether Donald might have obstructed justice by floating possible pardons to Stone and other allies who were swept up in Mueller's investigation of Trump Russia. Stone was charged by Mueller with lying to Congress about his communications and with the Trump campaign regarding WikiLeaks 2016 release of emails from the Democratic National Committee and Hillary Clinton campaign. U.S. authorities determined that the emails were hacked by Russian operatives seeking to boost Trump. Trump and Stone denied to Mueller that they had discussed WikiLeaks, but testimony from other Trump aides contradicted their accounts. Trump also lied, by the way, in in those written answers. Stone was convicted on seven felony counts that November and sentenced to 40 months in prison. But Trump, who publicly praised Stone for not flipping on him, commuted his prison sentence before it began and eventually pardoned him. Later, after the January 6th attack, a Danish film crew filmed Stone as he pressed for Trump to preemptively pardon him, Gates, and other allies for their efforts to overturn the election. The Post previously reported this. A former White House aide recently told the House Select Committee investigating January 6th that several Republican members of Congress, including Gates, had sought preemptive pardons. Trump last month said he might pardon supporters for January 6th if he becomes the president again, which prompted criticism, including from some Republican lawmakers, because that's obstruction of justice. Gates and Stone were speakers at an October 11th, 2019 event called AmpFest, a conference held by the pro-Trump group American Priority at the president's National Doral Golf Resort in South Florida. Stone was scheduled to stand trial in Washington four weeks later. Judge Amy Berman Jackson had placed him under a strict gag order after an image of Jackson's face beside a crosshairs logo was posted to Stone's Instagram account. He worked on that with the Proud Boys, by the way. Stone apologized, but was barred from discussing the case in public settings. Before his speech at AmpFest, Stone complained to several people backstage about his case, saying it was intended to damage Trump before the election in 2020. He lamented his situation to Benny Johnson, a pro-Trump operative who emceed the event, Stone claimed he would not receive a fair hearing in the Capitol, where Democrats far outnumbered Republicans. I'm on trial in the District of Columbia. You can imagine the complexion of the jury pool, uh, politically, said Stone. Uh Uh-huh. After he came off stage following his speech in the Donald J. Trump Grand Ballroom, (laughs) Stone was joined backstage by Gates. With event staff coming and going nearby, their conversation turned quickly to Stone's trial and Mueller's investigation. The Justice Department had previously released a version of Mueller's final report in which some sections were redacted to protect classified information, grand jury secrecy, and active investigations. Stone had asked Jackson to order prosecutors to show him a full, unredacted version of Mueller's report. On August 1st, 2019, Jackson granted Stone access to some redacted sections, the stuff pertaining to him, in Volume 1, which focused on Russia's interference. Jackson said her ruling most of the redacted material in volume two, which covered Trump's obstruction, uh, related to Stone, but she declined to let him see it. So it was ongoing. Do you remember how people are like, why hasn't the obstruction charges been filed? Why, you know, why are Mueller's obstruction charges just sitting there? Because at the end of 2019, that investigation was still ongoing and redacted in volume two. Now, the material was covered by a protective order that barred Stone from sharing it with anyone other than his lawyers and from using it for any purpose other than his legal defense. But backstage at AmpFest, Stone discussed the Mueller material with Gates in broad strokes, claiming that thanks to Jackson's ruling, he'd viewed the entire unredacted report, which he said held no damaging details on him. It's not clear what Stone meant by that. (laughs) Other than he was probably lying, Jackson's order had specified he could only view certain portions. Separately, the Justice Department had also shown varying amounts of the redacted material to congressional leaders, members of the Judiciary Intelligence Committees in the House and Senate, and a limited number of aides. From mid-June, members of the Judiciary Committees, such as Gates, were allowed to view some redacted sections of Volume 2. That's the obstruction volume of Mueller's report. Committee members and some aides could view the material in a secure space, a skiff, and were permitted to discuss the report only amongst themselves, the Stone prosecutors told Jackson in a court filing. And as they negotiated access to the material, committee chairman Jerry Nadler wrote then-Attorney General Barr that the committee had agreed that they cannot discuss what they have seen with anyone else. But speaking backstage at AmpFest, Gates discussed the redacted material with Stone. That puts him in legal jeopardy. Quote, we saw the skinny redaction, and there was, you know, There was a lot on you that was in the full redact that came out in the skinny redact. 
That's what Gates said. Before stating Stone was not going to have a defense. He didn't elaborate what he meant by skinny redaction, but I think I think what he means is the first version redacted report. There's a lot more on you in, in the less redacted report. As a person familiar with the matter who spoke on the condition of anonymity said the committee's agreement not to discuss the redacted material with outsiders was formalized in a written deal with the Justice Department. Stone told Gates during the backstage conversation that he was considering asking Trump for clemency in his criminal case. Quote, I may have to appeal to the big man because I've got, it's the District of Columbia. We surveyed 120 jurors. 90 of them know who I am and they hate my guts, said Roger. Gates agreed. Stone was fucked because of the D.C. jury, but he stressed that Trump viewed Stone favorably and Stone was unlikely to spend any time in prison after a conviction. Quote, I don't think you're going down at all at the end of the day, said Gates. He reiterated to Gates that he would not fold under pressure. From Mueller's team, he wouldn't flip. Quote, it would have been easy to make this go away, but I couldn't live with myself, said Stone. Meaning, if I flipped, I could make all this go away, but I just couldn't live with myself. Well, Gates said, you're a bullshit artist, not a liar. Correct, Stone said. There's a big difference. They went on to discuss a photograph of them posing with Joel Greenberg, then the tax collector of Seminole County, Florida. Stone said the photograph had come back to bite us in the ass. The Orlando Sentinel had reported the previous week that Greenberg had given publicly funded contracts to his friends and associates. Gates said, bite us in the ass? I'm incredibly proud of that. And toward the end of the recording of October 2019, One of the Danish filmmakers made his way towards Stone with a camera. The discussion shifted largely to small talk, such as a shared dislike of Washington. Gates quipped that to escape the Capitol, he might ask DeSantis to make him head of Florida's juvenile justice agency before reflecting that Trump would not permit him to leave. Quote, he had heard a rumor I was maybe not going to run for re-election. And at the Christmas party, he berated me in front of my date, like straight berated me, Gates said. Johnson, the MC who had drifted into the conversation, argued that it was a net positive to be berated by the president in front of a date. That's an alpha move, he said. (laughs) And that's old news. We remember that. Alpha move. During the October 2019 conversation, talk returned to Stone's case and to his early morning arrest by the FBI at his Florida home. Stone and his supporters had publicly claimed to be outraged that as a man in his 60s charged with nonviolent crimes, he was roused by heavily armed officers in a dawn raid. Because footage of Stone's arrest was recorded by CNN, Stone alleged that investigators properly alerted the media before his indictment was unsealed. Remember that? He said, you guys were colluding with CNN so you could get it all on camera. I predicted Stone's arrest the night before he was arrested. And then Gates says, my suspect for who tipped off the media is you. You were my first suspect. That's what Gates told Stone at AmpFest. And then Johnson said, come on, Roger, it was you. And then Roger said, innocent until proven guilty. So Stone tipped off CNN. All right, we'll be right back with the director of digital storytelling for Define American. You don't want to miss this very important discussion with Shauna Sigelko. Stay with us. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Here's something I use every day. It's called Thrive Cosmetics. They sell high-performance beauty and skincare products made with clean, skin-loving ingredients. No parabens, no sulfates, uh, no phthalates. Certified 100% vegan, 100% cruelty-free. And cause in cosmetics is there for a reason. Every purchase supports organizations that help women thrive so you can look good while supporting women from all over. I am obsessed with their Liquid Lash Extension Mascara. It's the best mascara I've ever used, and I have used every single mascara there is on the market. It's their best-selling product. It's more than 20,000 five-star reviews, and it's easy to see why. Ultra-lengthening, eye-opening mascara lasts all day, doesn't clump, doesn't run, doesn't smudge or flake. It mimics the look of lash extensions without damaging glue or expensive salon prices. Using clean, nourishing ingredients that support longer, stronger, and healthier-looking lashes over time, so it actually helps your real lashes. And it's so easy to take off. It uses warm water and a washcloth, and it just sort of slides right off. It's amazing. I also recently fell in love with their brilliant eye brightener. I've been using it for my TV appearances. A little bit in the corners of your eyes and then on your inside of your bottom lid and right under your brow and it just opens your eyes. It's so beautiful and it gives the perfect wash of color, glow, vibrant, well-rested look and it has 13 different shades. I like the rose gold myself. And thanks to the Bigger Than Beauty Giving Mission, for every product purchased, 
Thrive Cosmetics donates to help communities thrive. They have over 300 giving partners helping women with education, cancer, domestic abuse, and more. So now's a great time to try Thrive Cosmetics for yourself. Right now, you can get 15% off your first order when you visit thrivecosmetics.com slash dailybeans. That's Thrive Cosmetics, C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S dot com slash Daily Beans for 15% off your first order. You'll be glad you did. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm happy to be joined today by the Director of Digital Storytelling at Define American. Her name is Shauna Sigelko. Please welcome Shauna to the show. Hi. Hi, Allison. I'm glad to be here. I'm so glad you're here because, you know, after doing the podcast series on Wajahat Ali's Go Back to Where He Came From book and reading up a lot on the power of storytelling. I'm very, very excited about this project that you're that you're working on to counter anti-immigration messaging. Can you talk a little bit about Define American and what it is you guys are doing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Define American, we're a narrative change organization. So we really believe that in order for policy around immigration to change, First, we really need to change the national conversation. And our strategy to do that is through uh, working with uh, different media industries to tell more accurate and humanizing stories about the immigrant experience. So a lot of our work has been in the entertainment industry. We work with writers and directors in Hollywood. Um, We often bring undocumented folks uh, into writers' rooms so that they can share their uh, stories and so that when their stories are portrayed in mainstream television, they actually come from an authentic, accurate place. We also have a journalism program where we work with editors and reporters to help train them in how to talk about immigration in a more humanizing and accurate way. I lead the digital storytelling pillar, and my work really focuses on trying to shift the narrative about immigration uh, in digital spaces. As you can imagine, uh, the internet is very different than the entertainment uh, industry. There aren't gatekeepers in the same way. It's far more diffuse. So our strategy needed to look different. Back in 2018, we started to really examine the landscape of immigrant narratives online, specifically on YouTube. And the reason we started with YouTube is because relative to other platforms like Twitter or Facebook, there actually haven't been as many scholarly uh, investigations into far right radicalization on YouTube, even though there's actually been a lot of evidence that YouTube is the number one source for far right radicalization. Another statistic, 14.3 billion visits uh, to YouTube a month. That's more than Facebook, Wikipedia, Amazon or Instagram. So we really felt like that YouTube was an important platform to look at, but it certainly isn't the only platform we're, we're going to look at. And we had really three central questions about YouTube going into this study. How important is YouTube in shaping opinion and action around immigration in this country? Who are the people who are uh, spreading anti-immigrant rhetoric on the platform and what are they saying? And finally, how are those messages being disseminated? So for the first question, we partnered with an organization called Change Research, and we did a poll of likely voters in swing states in 2020. Um, And these were also people who watch YouTube at least once a week. And um, to that question, how important is YouTube in shaping uh, culture around immigration? The answer was a surprising, uh, very important We found that uh, 19% of those polled had changed their views on immigration because of content they'd seen on YouTube. That number's higher with 18 to 34-year-olds at 25%. 63% had talked with friends or family about immigration after watching something on YouTube. And that number really struck us. Um, It's it's really high, right? 63% is, is a very high percentage, but it's also a higher percentage than similar studies that look at Uh, traditional television mediums um, as a source for political action. So what it's indicating is that YouTube might be an even more powerful political activator than um, traditional television. 28% contacted a political representative and 21% changed their vote for a representative. So what we saw in this poll is that YouTube is an incredibly important space for shaping hearts and minds around the issue of immigration. Our next question was, Okay, so YouTube's really important, right? What is the content that's on YouTube that is, you know, coloring these perceptions and and shaping these opinions? 
So we partnered with Dr. Francesca Tripodi at the University of North Carolina, and she developed an iterative methodology to look at how, basically, what are the top performing anti-immigrant videos of the past 15 years on YouTube? So what, what is the most viral anti-immigrant content in the platform's history? Once we had that uh, information, we were actually able to start to see trends and patterns in the content. One of the most important findings, I think, is that we saw that the, all of the con- almost all of the content contained messages that supported the Great Replacement Theory, which I'm sure your, your audience has heard of the Great Replacement Theory, unfortunately. Just very uh, broadly, it's a conspiracy theory that uh, Jewish elites are encouraging mass immigration uh, of people of color to replace the white population in the U.S. and to have um, political control. Yeah. And, and uh, recent studies show that that is the motivation behind most of the people that attacked the Capitol on January 6th. They come from not super red places. They come from, you know, blue dots or purple dots. And they're, um, you know, very, very worried about this about this great replacement theory. What, what sort of findings were there when you analyze the data about the dehumanization of immigrants? Because I, I feel like a lot of the language that gets sort of glossed over for the bigger impact anti-immigrant stuff at the end of the statement, there's a lot of dehumanization in the beginning of a lot of statements. And I think that, you know, you being in charge of the digital storytelling arm of of define american you know i believe that storytelling is the best way to combat that dehumanization piece right absolutely uh, that's definitely our theory of change that in order to really change this conversation we have to tell better stories and we have to make sure that the right audiences are seeing them when it comes to dehumanization in the narratives that was so baked into all of the content that we studied. Like all of it, probably, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like when you're talking yeah. about great replacement, there was a huge trend in that. But I feel like pretty much any anti-immigration message on YouTube is going to have that dehumanization piece in it. It's like a building block for other things. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would say that probably the most important element of that building block is fear mongering. So a common message that we saw throughout the videos was, you know, don't listen to progressives or pro-immigration advocates because they're not being logical. We are telling you the facts. We're not biased. We're just telling you the facts. But actually, they were pushing a very fear-based narrative, one of scarcity, one of obviously the Great Replacement is um, imbued with a lot of paranoia and fear. Uh, So it's actually quite emotionally manipulative, the content. And I think that in order to be emotionally manipulative, you have to dehumanize the population that you're using to scare people. So what did you find in the Great Replacement Network? Because I was looking at some of the findings in these studies and you talk about the Great Replacement Network. What is that about? Yeah. So the Great Replacement Network is what we named the channels that had published the most viral anti-immigrant content in YouTube history. And one of the surprising findings is that actually the majority of the content comes from two sources, a channel called PragerU. And uh, <laughs> you're smiling because I know you've heard of them. Dude, that guy, I had to talk to that guy <laughs> at Politicon. I had to talk to that guy. And he just oh, kept wow. asking me why I was a whore. You know, like, oh, uh, oh my God. why do you love being a whore? Why are you such a whore? And I'm like, wow. And he was like 19, Matt something I can't remember, but wow. Yeah. PragerU, I'm not surprised. Yeah. They pop up, you know, we've known about PragerU for many years doing this narrative change work. So when their videos popped up in our network, we, we weren't surprised at all. But the other major content producer is the Tantan Network. The Tantan Network has been around since the late seventies. Jonathan Tantan was a eugenicist. It's, it's documented. And he founded a series of think tanks and organizations that all have extremely academic and official sounding names. <laughs> the Center for Immigration Studies or Federation for American Immigration Reform or FAIR, Numbers USA. These all sound like really legitimate institutions. And they're actually quoted regularly by mainstream media as uh, legitimate sources. Many of them have been designated hate groups by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And they've actually been running a 
multi-million dollar uh, anti-immigration media machine for decades. Well, yeah, that's I mean, that's what they kind of have to do, right? Like just how Donald had to scrape into the bottom of the barrel to find idiots who, you know, thought that he actually won the election, that there was election fraud. And that's why you've got Sidney Powell and the pillow man and leaders of white, white nationalist supremacist groups and, uh, and the overstock CEO in the in the White House. Right. It's so what they, these guys do is they have this hate platform. They say, boy, we need mm-hmm. some legit sounding uh, sources to back us up on our bullshit. So they create them themselves and they give them those kinds of names. They do it you know, the Freedom National Family Center for Awesomeness or whatever. And they just they put this stuff together just to create sources for themselves, for their own feedback loop. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been extremely successful. I think that if if I could impart one finding from this study that that I really want people to understand, it's that I think there's kind of this pervasive idea out there that uh, xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment boils up from the populace. And it's just kind of an unfortunate uh, element of American culture. And while, of course, that's that's true, what we see with the modern anti-immigration movement is that this is really an intentional, well-funded machine that, uh, it, you know, the content that exists on YouTube that's really coloring opinions on immigration, they're not being posted by and, you know, the average Joe who uh, has these opinions and has done his own research, it's its really propaganda and it's its really well uh, strategically placed to convince average Americans that, that they're in danger due to immigration. Yeah. And if anyone takes a minute, if they haven't already and watches the two minute video that Donald Trump played at the ellipse before he gave the speech where he incited everyone to march to the Capitol, that mm-hmm. video is reminiscent of something Goebbels would put together. I mean, it's got like sure. this anti-Semitic imagery. And then here's the one man who can fix it uh, with, you know, Donald Trump's face with the light coming up from underneath and the red light around him. And I mean, it's just it's it's frighteningly scary how how like whoever made it was probably Stephen Miller, but whoever made <laughs> this was just taking a page out of obvious propaganda anti-Semitic sure. propaganda and great replacement theory propaganda. It's just it's mind blowing that people I guess people weren't alive back then, so they fall for it now. But yeah, it's not coming from the bottom up. It's coming from the top down. Exactly. And I think that um, something else we saw in our study uh, speaking to how the propaganda is packaged. I do think sometimes people can identify when something is uh, extremist or overt. What we saw time and time again in the content that we studied is that it's actually packaged and couched in an aesthetic that looks very educational and dry and innocuous. I come from a filmmaking background, so the aesthetic side of this really interested me that we saw in these explainer videos or, um, you know, fake college lectures that uh, they're really conveying a sense of authority and, you know, uh, credibility that they might not have. But uh, if you're just, you know, someone on YouTube looking for information about this extremely confusing issue, you might trust uh, something that looks like this. Yeah. And and they don't have that credibility. And we saw that when Lindell tried to put together his cyber symposium and had a a theater with a screen and microphones and podiums and, you know, just trying to sort of dress up this absolute insane bullshit that that like sure. and, and they're like no but look we're at a we're at a university or or you know when Rudy Giuliani tries to have a legislative hearing at the holiday inn it's like it, it that's what it is it's dressing up the great replacement theory anti-semitism anti-immigration xenophobia as if it's academic and has mm-hmm. some sort of you know legitimate any merit <laughs> merit exactly yeah Yeah, totally. Well, tell everybody before I let you go where they can get this information and learn more about what you're doing at Define American, because I think this is incredibly important. I think getting the digital stories out there, storytelling is one of the most powerful tools that we can use to pretty much combat anything, but especially this kind of stuff. Tell tell everyone where they can find and follow and and learn. Yeah, definitely. So we found a bunch of tips and recommendations for storytellers during this research. And we've consolidated them into an open source toolkit that you can find at defineamerican.com. We also have our full research report on that website. 
And uh, yeah, we're currently in the process of working with partners to try to develop some counter narrative content to this filth. So um, please check out our website to learn more. If you ever want to put together a podcast of immigration stories, you know, you know who to call. <laughs> oh, I might, I, I might, I might take you up on that. <laughs> because that would be amazing to actually have and hear these stories in, in series and podcasts where we can get it out into a bunch of ears. I would love that. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it, Shauna. And we will talk soon. We'll talk again as the midterms get closer because this impacts voters. It really does. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. Hey, everybody, it's AG. You know, I used to have sleep problems until I got my custom mattress from Helix Sleep. Helix Sleep has a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete, and it matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you, customized and everything just for how you sleep. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand that provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. The Helix lineup has 14 mattresses now, including a collection of luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, and even a mattress for kids. I took the Helix quiz. I was matched with the Helix Midnight because I'm a side sleeper and I need a medium firm bed. It's the best mattress I've ever owned, hands down, head and shoulders. There is a 10 to 15 year warranty depending on the model and you get to try it out for 100 nights with no risk. It's such a good deal. So go to helixsleep.com slash daily beans, take the quiz, order the mattress you're matched to and it will come right to your door, ship completely free and you can start experiencing the best night's sleep of your life. Helix was awarded number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ and Wired. And they've been recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a solution for improving your sleep. And right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for listeners. Just go to helixsleep.com slash daily beans. With Helix, better sleep starts now. And now that you've heard me talk about how much I love Helix, I have great news. Helix has gone beyond the bedroom and started making furniture for the rest of your house. Sofas, armchairs, love seats. It's called All Form, and they make premium, customizable stuff for your living room and your family room, and it's shipped right to your door fast. And these are so cool. For starters, it's the easiest way you can customize a sofa using premium materials, but at a fraction of the cost of traditional stores. You pick your fabric, which is spill, stain, and scratch resistant, the color, the color of the legs, the sofa size and shape to make sure it's perfect for you and your home. Armchairs, love seats, all the way up to eight-seat sectionals. There's something for everyone. All form sofas are also delivered directly to your home with fast free shipping in the mail in three to seven days, three to seven days. And you can assemble it yourself in a few minutes with no tools. One I chose was a three seater sofa in whiskey colored leather, as you know, with walnut legs and a chaise. It looks amazing. It got here fast. I love the way it looks in my living room. And you get 100 days to decide if you want to keep it. And if you don't love it, they'll pick it up for free and give you a full refund. They also have a forever warranty, literally forever. So to find your perfect sofa, go to allform.com slash daily beans. And right now, Allform is offering 20% off all orders for listeners. That's allform.com slash daily beans. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Good news. Good news. And if you have any good news, corrections, confessions, Halloween photos, Santa, Easter bunny, anything you want to send in, shit kids say, shit you say, shit adults say, misheard song lyrics, anything funny, tell me a joke, weird puns. I love puns. I especially love nautical puns more often than not. <laughs> Get it? Okay. Anyway, send it into us at dailybeanspod.com. Click on contact. First up from Lori, pronoun she and her. I'm a potter and I listen to the beans every day in my studio. Oh, I miss throwing ceramics, throwing pots. Okay. Self-employment as an artist is a heck of a lot of work and I would never be able to keep up with all the hearings, legal cases and shenanigans were it not for you. I appreciate all the work you do to keep us informed and the humor to keep us sane. Did you know the collective noun for cats is a clouder? I've attached a photo of a couple of cats from my home clouder. Finn is the black and white and Petey is gray. They love each other very much and cuddle like this even during our recent heat wave here in Maine. I've also attached photos of a couple things I made while listening to the beans. Shine on, friends, and thanks for all you do. Look at the babies. (gasps) Cuddles. Aw, so cute. Oh, wow, these are beautiful. Oh, my gosh, that's so pretty. Thank you for sending these. It's like a peach-colored pot with this beautiful, almost hibiscus uh, flower sort of embellishment painted on it glazed on it's just gorgeous and i love the way it's like a little akimbo 
Thank you so much for sending these in. And, you know, if you sell any of these and you want us to give a shout out to your little pot shop, let us know, Lori. Just send it in. Next up from Ducky, pronouns she and her. Hey, queen. Thanks for sharing about your fur baby. It's difficult watching them deteriorate. I've been lucky enough to provide the VIP life for a few animals from their infancy to passing. It's really good to know no one is alone in missing them. It's beautiful you celebrated life rather than death. Self-correction. I sent in pet tax before saying I have a blue cat rather than gray. In my defense, in that moment, I couldn't remember if it was spelled gray, G-R-A-Y, or G-R-E-Y. Somehow hearing another human say blue seemed strange and felt worth correcting. (laughs) Speaking of Haku, the gray cat, he went to the vet for one year shots and found only one descended testicle. Hmm. The vet said it could be due to the way he was standing, genetics, or maybe there isn't another one. Since then, I've never been so upset with my meandering mind landing on thoughts of if I should manually try to find the second ball myself as the surgery estimate doubled for neutering with a missing testicle. What? It should be 50% off. It should be half off, Ducky. Good news. I substitute teach, and today I was an aide at a special education room. By the end of the day, I was tired, and three kids put bristle blocks in my hair like curlers. I shook my head, and they flew in different directions, and we all laughed so hard. When we were done, the main teacher said she'd not heard one of the girls giggle that hard or seen her be so sweet. It's hard and rewarding subbing in South Texas. I'm so grateful for all the teachers and school staff sticking it out here. Anyway, new pet tax of Haku and Kamaji. Keep on cursing, Beans Queens. Look, oh. <laughs> I said blue because the Russian blue cats are gray. What? This is so hilarious. Look at this. Look at this power play of the void kitten on top of the gray one. And then there again as adults. OK, so I guess that's just how they roll. Oh, my God. Look at the long boy. He's so slonky. Look at that long void. So beautiful. And then the butt up on the couch. That's interesting. (laughs) Thanks for this. I appreciate that post so much. Next up from Liz, she and her. I don't know why I let myself read your whole story on boobs. It was so similar to what we went through with our Miss Brian. Pro tip, don't name the dog after yourself. We held her at the vet's office. My husband, Brian, myself, and our seven-year-old. I wish we had been able to do it at home. So Radio, one of our doggos, would have been able to say goodbye. It was a beautiful story. I hope you feel better soon. Aside from the sadness, I have to tell you how much you and DG brighten my world. We are blue souls in red Arkansas. Who Liz. <laughs> we hope to move soon as political and climate refugees to a more northerly location. But until then, this podcast is a light in the nasty, hot, humid darkness. <laughs> Thank you both. I feel feel like there's like groups of underground, you know, Democrats in these ruby red places, like down in basements, listening to the beans. Pet Tax. Radio is our Aussie German Shepherd mix and is so soft and sweet and guards us all from dangerous male persons, pest controllers and anyone walking down our street. Bob Roberts is a Bob Roberts is a beagle. (laughs) You named your beagle Bob Roberts. That's amazing. Beagle homeschooling therapy dog, whose name is a nod to the great Tim Robbins movie. Yeah. I just feel certain you have seen it. If not, do it. Yes, of course. Look at this. Look at these babies. So that's what an Aussie Shepherd mix looks like. How beautiful. And a beagle. Whoa, whoa. So cute. Thank you. Thank you for sending in your puppers. Yes. And and that story was hard to write. Uh, I, I did a big thread on Twitter about uh, how the boobs departed. And... um. I just wanted to get it down. I wanted to, to write it so that I wouldn't forget. And then I wanted people to know they weren't alone. So yes, thank you. It was difficult to write that. Next from Amanda, they and them. My son got his second dose of Moderna last week and will be fully protected just in time for his fourth birthday party next week. This will be his first real birthday party. So he's very excited. I am too. It's been a very long couple of years waiting for a vaccine that can protect my whole family. Here's my son with our awesome golden retriever, Lizzie. We got her at the start of the pandemic and they've grown up together ever since. What a beautiful, beautiful little family you have. Is that a kiddie pool? Is that an outdoor pool with the dog? That's amazing. I love this. That's so green. Where are you? Where? That's lovely. Anyway, wherever you're at, that's a beautiful yard. Next up from Mooney, she and her. Hello, beanies. Help. I think my cat is broken, much like our country right now. I managed to turn the instruction manual over and reassemble her in the correct manner. 
maybe we could have Congress try to turn the insurrection, the instruction manual around to read the directions better. Yeah, that might be a good idea, Mooney. Thank you for your tireless dives into the news every single day. I really do think it helps. I know it helps me. Look at the, look at the twisty pretzel cat. Hello. Oh, so cute. That's a big fluffy tail. That's a big floof tail. I wonder if when your cat gets scared, does the tail get like a big giant Christmas tree? Because that, that was, we call that in our house, we call it Christmas tree tail. Next up from Kelly, she and her, hello, was organizing my kitchen drawers and found this cookie cutter that looks amazingly like Josh Hawley running. Thought you two would have fun and be creative with it. Maybe make some Christmas ornaments entitled Hauling Ass This Christmas and use the proceeds for a charity. Let me know if you want it. Thanks for keeping me informed and sane during my work travels. And yes, it does. <laughs> yes, you can send it. I want to make Josh Holly cookies um, for my war on Christmas that I'm going to be doing this year. Uh, you know, we do it every year. We're funded by Soros. We have our basements, uh, our meetings in the basement of a pizza kitchen. So send this to me. Uh, the address, the P.O. box is at MullerSheWrote.com. And uh, I will definitely make some some holly cookies <laughs> so great i give them to joelle she's she's the the cookie baker extraordinaire you should check out her cookies at chubet bakery all right thank you for sending these in thank you for all the pet pics please continue to send in pet pics and uh, the beautiful ceramics from Lori. these are all just wonderful and the the doggo all the doggos so adorable you can send everything in to me at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Dana will be back soon. She is okay. She is just out traveling. I'm going to see if I can pull in some other guest hosts this week. But regardless of who is guest hosting, I will bring you the news with swearing because that's what I do. And I'll do it. Uh, I'll, I, I, I don't see me stopping anytime soon. So you don't have to worry. So I'll be back tomorrow with the beans. I suspect tomorrow might be kind of a big news day. So I'm going to go ahead and predict that tomorrow's introduction headlines is going to be a minute and nine seconds long. Okay, I'm going to write it down here and we're going to see tomorrow what we come up with. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q. I've been AG and them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg and Amy Carrero. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for the Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants, and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. <laughs>